This episode brought to you by Mova Globes. For more information, look at the end of the episode. The historian Plutarch relates the now famous story about Philip II of Macedonia, the father of Alexander the Great, and the city-state of Sparta. Philip was said to have sent a message to Sparta that said, If once I enter your lands, I will destroy ye, never to rise again. And the Spartans were said to respond with a single word, if. Of course, the military prowess of the Spartans was legendary, even in their own time, especially after the Battle of Thermopylae. And the Spartans had secured the position as the strongest city-state in Greece with their defeat over Athens in the Peloponnesian War in 404 BC. But by the time Philip sent his message, Sparta was really nothing more than a minor power. Sparta held undisputed the position as the strongest city-state in Greece for a mere 30 years before being toppled suddenly and decisively. And many of the same factors that allowed them to gain their power contributed to their downfall. The rise and fall of the mighty city-state of Sparta deserves to be remembered. The laws that came to define classical Sparta, known in antiquity as Lacedaemon, came after a period of lawlessness in the 8th and 7th century BC Peloponnesus that ended with the social and political reforms traditionally attributed to the semi-mythical figure Lycurgus. This included the development of the Spartan Agoge, the Spartan school that educated and trained boys from the age of seven. Early on, the Spartans conquered the nearby state of Messenia and forced its people into a position of state-owned serfdom. This population was the foundation of what allowed Spartiates, or Spartan citizens and soldiers, to spend all of their time training, while the slaves, called Hillets, took care of farming and other labor. A third class, the Periokoi, ran commerce, crafts, and manufacturing, as Spartan citizens were forbidden from doing any kind of money-making activity. Sparta first rose to military prominence in Greece after they defeated the Messenians and their Greek allies in the Second Messenian War, sometime in the mid-7th century BC. For the next several hundred years, their reputation as the best land force in Greece was unequaled. The Spartans received considerable credit for their leadership in repelling the Persians at Thermopylae and Plataea. Athens took over fighting Persia after that, building the Delian League to continue the fight. Athens quickly began using league funds to its own ends and used military might to punish members who didn't toe the line. In 456 BC, Thassos rebelled and asked for Spartan aid. It was an opportune time, as Spartan warhawks were already worried that Athens was a threat to Spartan power. A plan was even made to invade Attica, but the plans were tabled when what Thucydides called the Great Earthquake struck Sparta. Contemporary reports of the earthquake are sparse. Later historians said it was greater than any before reported. Greek historian Diodorus claimed that 20,000 were killed by the quake, and Plutarch says that it demolished the entire city, with the exception of five houses. But Spartan houses were famously, well, Spartan. They were small and they were single story, and so most historians assume that the death toll must have been exaggerated, but still, it must have been a large earthquake. A 1991 study that was looking for evidence of the earthquake determined that it must have had a surface wave magnitude of some 7.2, and the earthquake would play a large role in the later decline of the powerful city-state. Dissatisfied helots saw this as an opportunity and revolted in Messenia. One probably legendary story says that the Spartan army was marched out of the city in time to save it from the earthquake, but it's difficult to know the actual cost. It is telling that the Spartan army couldn't put down the revolt. The Spartans called on help from the Hellenic League, and several cities sent aid, including Athens. The rebels fortified their position on Mount Itom, and the Greeks were unable to break through. The Spartans saw Athens' soldiers as a threat, and they were concerned that the democratic ideals might incite others to revolt, or that the Athenians could even join the Helots. Eventually, the suspicion boiled over, and the Spartans demanded that the Athenian force leave. The other allies remained, and Athenians were deeply insulted. The pro-Spartan party in Athens crumbled, and the Athenians broke off their friendship with Sparta. Athens welcomed exiled rebels when Sparta finally defeated the revolt. The First Peloponnesian War involved the needs and rivalries of a number of states, but was essentially a conflict between Athens' Delian League and the Spartan Peloponnesian League. The war ended in a stalemate in the signing of the Thirty Years' Peace in 446. Fifteen years later, war broke out again in what historians call just the Peloponnesian War. The war was fought on and off between 431 and 404 BC, with the Spartans eventually defeating the Athenian navy. It was the costliest war in Greek history, but gave the Spartans unquestioned hegemony over Greece. 
This was the peak of Spartan power. King Agesilaus II even took an army to Ionia to fight the Persians. Unfortunately, other Greek states weren't willing to sit idly by. Ten years after the end of the Peloponnesian War, Thebes, Athens, Corinth, and Argos formed a coalition backed by the Persians to disrupt Spartan control. Agesilaus came home to deal with the rebellious cities, but a Spartan fleet was destroyed by the Persians at the Battle of Nidus, marking the end of Sparta's attempts to rule the sea. While Agesilaus and the Spartans fought their foes to a standstill on land, Athens rebuilt the long walls between the city and its port at Piraeus and rebuilt their fleet. The fleet began to recapture Spartan-controlled islands in the Aegean, and the Athenians began supporting anti-Persian forces in Egypt and Cyprus. Persia's primary goal was to keep the Greeks divided so that they would stop messing with their borders, and so a rising Athens was not ideal. The Spartan Antalcidas was able to negotiate with the Persians and made a deal that if the other Greeks refused to accept peace, Persia would switch its support to Sparta. The peace was called Antalcidas' Peace, or the King's Peace, referring to Artaxas II of Persia. Greek cities would remain autonomous, which primarily meant the various leagues were outlawed, benefiting Sparta, while Greece as the whole agreed to leave Ionia and Cyprus to the Persians. The Spartans secured their hegemony, but it was Persia who benefited the most. The Spartans took advantage of their leadership, punishing disloyal cities like Mantinea, and Agesilaus pushed Sparta camping further afield. In 382 BC, a Spartan general, marching against far-off Chalcidice, stopped in Thebes, and on behalf of the oligarchic party there, seized the city's citadel, the Cadmea. He executed the anti-Spartan leader, put pro-Spartan men in charge of the city, and left a garrison. The Theban Pelopidas fled with supporters to Athens, where he masterminded a conspiracy to return. When they did, a few years later, they ambushed and killed their political opponents, captured the Spartan garrison, and freed the city. The Spartans failed to retake the city and made a failed assault on Athens, which drove Athens to ally with Thebes. The newly built Athenian fleet delivered a stunning defeat to the Spartan navy at Naxos. In Boeotia, Pelopidas learned that the Spartans had left a city undefended to go on an expedition elsewhere. He hastily marched to take the city, but turned back when he learned reinforcements were already near the city. He didn't get back to Thebes before he ran into the returning troops of the expedition near the city of Tegira. Pelopidas commanded the Sacred Band of Thebes, an elite unit made up of 150 pairs of men devoted to each other by mutual obligations of love, and some 200 cavalry. The Spartan force numbered somewhere between 1,000 and 1,800. Plutarch says that upon seeing the Spartans, one Theban said, We are fallen into our enemy's hands, and Pelopidas responded, And why not they? Into ours. Pelopidas ordered his men into an unusually dense formation and charged the Spartan phalanx, while the cavalry harassed their flanks. The Spartan leaders were killed early in the battle, and the dense formation was able to punch through the thinner Spartan line. Once through, the Thebans struck the Spartan rear and flanks, and routed the whole formation. It was the first time the Spartans had been beaten on land, by a lesser force. Fearful of Theban supremacy, Athens forced Thebes and Sparta into a peace negotiation. The negotiation fell apart because Thebes sought to rebuild its old Boeotian League, and the general, if Epaminondas, insisted on signing behalf of the League, and not just Thebes. This was unacceptable to King Agesilaus, who crossed Thebes' name off the treaty and then went home to prepare for war. Almost immediately, the Spartans sent a force under a second king, Cleombrotus, to bring Thebes to heel. The Spartans met the Boeotian forces near the small village of Leuctra on July 6, 371. The Boeotians were outnumbered, with between six and 9,000 hoplites and 1,500 cavalry facing some 10,000 or slightly more Spartans and their allies, along with 1,000 cavalry. Epaminondas convinced the other generals to fight. Epaminondas broke from the traditional Greek battle plan. In general, the Greeks would put their strongest unit on the right side of their formation in a phalanx 8 to 12 men deep. This meant that the opposing force's best troops didn't meet head-on, but hit the weaker flank and attempted to turn it quick enough to rout the whole formation. Instead, the Thebans put their best troops, including the sacred band and some cavalry, on the left flank opposite the Spartans' veterans in a phalanx 50 deep. The rest of the Theban line was laid out diagonally and behind the initial force, screened by cavalry and slingers. The Theban flank smashed the Spartan formation, killing the king and hundreds of Spartans. The rest of the Spartan line, held mostly by Spartan allies who were less enthusiastic about fighting, broke immediately. Reports differ, but the Spartans lost somewhere between 1,000 and 4,000 soldiers, while the Theban casualties were much smaller. Even though it was a small battle, Leuctra had immediate and dramatic repercussions throughout Greece. The Spartan myth of superiority was shattered completely, ending in a day what the Spartans had carefully built and sustained for centuries. 
Epaminondas marched against the Peloponnese four times in the following years, supporting cities that broke away from Sparta. An Arcadian League brought many of the cities on Sparta's northern border together, and the Thebans even invaded Laconia itself. Most disastrously for the Spartans, the Thebans freed Messenia and fortified the town of Messene, depriving Sparta of a third of its land and an even greater percentage of the Helot population. The Thebans had their work cut out for them as their power drove their allies away. While Sparta remained handicapped, Thebes remained at war on several fronts. In 362 BC, nearly all of Greece was arrayed on one side or the other when Epaminondas marched against Mantinea. Sparta, Athens, and the other states stood with Mantinea against Thebes and her allies. The Battle of Mantinea was one of the largest ever in classical Greece, and there were more than 50,000 troops present. Epaminondas again used innovative tactics, lulling his enemies into thinking he was setting up camp before suddenly attacking. While the Thebans won the day, Epaminondas was killed, likely by a Spartan. Thebes' power was spent. The Greek states had essentially battered each other into submission, making it easy for Alexander the Great's father, Philip II, to defeat them. Sparta, alone among the Greeks, refused to join Philip's Corinthian League, but despite their still intact laconic wit, the Spartans no longer represented much of a threat, and Philip was able to seize some of their borderlands. In 331, King Aes III of Sparta declared war on Macedon, hoping to take advantage of the recent rebellion of Thrace. Alexander's general, Antipater, defeated them soundly and killed Aes. The battle at Leuctra drew a stark line across Sparta's history. The question of why the powerful state fell so suddenly continues to persist. The earthquake in 464, though nearly a century before Leuctra, might have contributed to an obvious and serious decline in Spartan manpower. According to Herodotus, the Spartans called all men between the ages of 20 and 55 to fight at Batea in 479, which brought up as many as 6,000 Spartiates, Spartan citizens who had gone through the training in the Agoge. They mustered about 4,000 in 418, and there may have been as few as 1,000 by the time of Leuctra. The earthquake may have killed some soldiers, and certainly killed wives and children living communally in the Agoge, but it's impossible to know how great an effect that had on Spartan numbers. Other theories have also been put forward. Spartan citizenship was always a closely protected privilege that belonged only to a small group of people. The Peloponnesian War forced the normally strict caste system to admit helots as warriors, at least some of whom were freed following service. A good example of Sparta's struggle for manpower. It was much easier to lose one's citizenship than it was to gain it, and Spartan soldiers who showed weakness or children who failed in the agoge were expelled from the ranks. Plutarch describes an initiation ceremony, claiming that if any member of the group objected to an initiate, the man would be denied entrance to the unit. Spartan men also married late, from 25 or later, and they could not maintain a home until they were 30. This meant that many Spartan warriors died without ever having children. The declining number of Spartiates can also be attributed to wealth inequality. Aristotle, to modern historians famously misogynistic, blames Sparta's tradition of allowing women to inherit land, which kept it from supporting more soldiers. Still, by 300 BC, wealth was accumulating, belonging to only around 100 families. Conservative feelings in Sparta delayed any reform until after the city had been humbled. Each Spartiate, also called the homioi, or the Simblers, was given a plot of land worked by helots, which was meant to support them. They were expected to contribute to their unit's meals, and if they were unable to produce enough, could lose their place in the unit and their citizenship. Without a doubt, there was a shift in Spartan society during and after the Peloponnesian War, when a number of new social classes appeared. The Neodomodes, meaning literally lately made one of the people, were helots freed after serving in the army. The inferiors are less well known, but could have included former Spartiates and perhaps illegitimate children. Some textual evidence suggests that as Spartan manpower needs became greater, periokoi and helots were used in greater numbers to supplement Spartan strength. The Spartans remained a minor regional power after Leuctra and participated in several wars over the course of the next 200 years, but their reputation was no longer legendary, and nor was their performance. This might be because they were slow to adapt new tactics like they had seen at Leuctra, and that certainly affected the tactics of Alexander. The Romans conquered Sparta, and despite many efforts to reform and return to the original traditions, the Spartans never again lived up to that legendary reputation. And of course today, that legendary reputation is pretty much all that survives. But the rise and fall of Sparta is important. It represents that period between when the Persians failed to conquer Greece and the rise of Alexander. It played an important role in the future of Western civilization. If you've been watching the History Guide lately, you might have noticed this amazing item on my set. This is called a MOVA globe. And if you watch carefully, you see that this globe is rotating all by itself. 
Is it magic? No, actually, this is first of its kind technology, and this globe rotates merely by the power of ambient light and the Earth's own magnetism, so it doesn't require any batteries or any power. We'll just sit and it will rotate. This particular globe is based on a globe that was designed by a talented engraver from Rome named Giovanni Maria Cassini in 1790. Cassini made many influential maps and globes and he was a fan of the explorer James Cook. So if you look on this you'll see that he has tracked three of Cook's voyages on the map. And this is historically accurate to Giovanni Maria Cassini's globe. You see it doesn't have Antarctica on it because Cassini didn't believe yet that it was a real continent. Now you might want this, this is perfect for the history guy, but you also might want to choose, say, a more modern globe. In fact, you can choose from more than 40 designs for MOVA globes, not just many globes of the Earth, but also globes of planets and moons that were designed in consultation with NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, as well as famous works of art. You know, this is a fantastic thing to put on your desk or your mantle. It's a great conversation starter. It'd be a great gift for a friend or maybe a student who's off to college. It would be the sort of gift that deserves to be remembered. And the best part is that Mova Globes is giving a special discount just to our viewers. If you go to MovaGlobes.com and use the code HISTORY, that's MovaGlobes.com with the code HISTORY, you'll get 10% off your order for your very own Mova Globe. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.